Good morning, YouTube. It's Keen again. Those of you who have been longtime viewers around my Twitch streams might have noticed that I've been streaming less and less Splatoon 2 on my channel recently. A few months ago, I made a video on this channel where I covered the patch notes for version 5.5.0 of Splatoon 2, which dropped back in September of this year. And I'll have a link to that in the description of this video. It's been some time since then, and I think the meta has settled itself a bit more since that patch, where my overall thoughts was that I was kind of underwhelmed with the changes in it. And now that I think that some more time has passed, I think I have to be honest about it. I think this patch might be one of my least favorite that I've played in this game in its entirety from its release in 2017, all the way up until now. And I've kind of been sitting around thinking about that recently, you know, as I've not been streaming the game for, I want to say about the past month, and I wanted to really try and figure out what it is that's really turned me away from the game recently. Also, before we dive into this video, I'm going to tell you that this video isn't going to have a ton of visuals to supplement what I'm talking about outside of maybe a dumb gag I throw in during editing. So honestly, you can feel free to just throw this in the background, just listen really. It's just going to be mostly me rambling, kind of just giving some perspective and my own thoughts and reflections, I suppose. All right, so the first place that we need to start when we're talking about this kind of topic is to discuss the meta of Splatoon, and we have to look at what is common, popular, used, what's winning, what do you tend to see when you play the game at a competitive level, and I'm specifically talking about the higher end of uh, competitive play. And I think I can say that most active players of this game could probably define this meta within a couple of words, but I'm just going to start with one in particular here. And that word that I'm going to start with is shooters. I think shooters as a singular word probably describes the metagame of Splatoon 2 as of late. Many of the most common meta weapons right now are shooters, and I could give you a few examples and feel like I'm going on and on, but to name a few, we have Anzep 85, Kensa Splattershot, Kensa 52 Gal, Splattershot Jr., Neo Splashomatic, Bushomatic you'll often see in Rainmaker. You're seeing a lot more of vanilla jet sculpture these days. We've seen a lot of custom jet sculpture. We've seen Foil Squeezer, we've seen H3 Nozzle Nose D. And yes, Squeezer and H3 are technically semi autos, but they're a subclass of shooters. So don't point that out in the comments. I know you're probably sitting there writing it right now, but stay with me here for a second as we as we dive into this. And you know, that's not to say you don't see other weapon classes necessarily. You'll see a lot less frequent usage of, you know, some of the, the next few weapons I'll list than you would shooters, but you know, you might see the occasional Soda Slosher, Kenza Rapid, Tri Slosher, Bamboozler. You'll see Nautilus 89 oftentimes in a TC or Rainmaker. You know, those are options. But the, the point I'm getting at is for the vast majority of games that you're going to be playing or watching at a higher competitive level, I promise you that you're more likely than not going to see a minimum of two shooters on each team, if not more. Okay, so you're probably just sitting there wondering, all right, Keen. You have a point. There's a lot of heckin' shooters in this game. But why are we seeing so many of these weapons over other options, do you think? You play Brawl on Tent, don't those fare particularly well against shooters? Wouldn't those be really strong in a metagame defined by shooters? And I would tell you, why yes, dear viewer, who I'm definitely sure is subscribed to this channel and liking the videos, you're right! But now we have to talk about how patches have shaken up the meta of this game over time and what they've done to weapon picks and their viability and the options that they have. And before we dive uh, into the specifics of a few particular examples I'll talk about in this video, we're going to have to talk about a pretty scary word. And that word is... Alright, so to start, let's just quickly define power creep for those who may not be familiar with exactly what it means. Power creep is a situation where updates or expansions to a game introduce more powerful units or abilities leaving the older ones underpowered by comparison. Power creep can happen in a multitude of different ways, being not necessarily only new options, but there's also a form of power creep when you nerf the best options in a metagame. Options that were not as strong as the most prevalent ones will get better as a lot of the options that are better than those tend to gatekeep them, so when you nerf a few things that are top tier, something that was previously high tier, may now be a new top tier because it's no longer struggling against the top tier it may not have done well against. And I think Splatoon 2 has honestly suffered from kind of 
both angles of the power creep. There have been a lot of weapons introduced to this game that were very overtuned when they were first added, but that's kind of normal, especially when it's a newer weapon. A new weapon class is difficult to balance those kinds of things. That's normal. I was used to it. There have been many weapons that I think were overtuned when they dropped into the game, but I didn't super, super mind them because they generally did a good job of balancing them out eventually. I think the bigger problem actually stems from the latter kind of power creep where you nerf a ton of the good options. So then the options that were already pretty good only end up getting better. Generally speaking, the development team for Splatoon 2 has been more of a fan of toning down weapons when they're considered top tier or very, very good. The kinds of nerfs you'll tend to see from a lot of patches in this game, especially if you go back through the history, will be a special point cost increase, you know, a plus 10 or plus 20 cost for a weapon to get a special You'll often see this when a weapon is considered spammy to some sort of degree, and we'll touch more upon that in a little bit. A really popular one the devs really did for a long duration of this game is they would nerf the ink efficiency of a weapon. When you nerf the ink efficiency of a weapon, you essentially give it a weakness in the form of downtime because you're not going to be able to actively be using your weapon all the time. You're going to have less paint output because you're going to have to more. You're going to have to have more breathers where you slow down recover some ink because you might have less shots or it's more committal to throw bombs, that sort of thing. You might see damage reductions if they think a weapon's kill potential or the damage that it has isn't really suitable to them. A lot of the times you may see a nerf where a weapon that used main power might need more slots, so therefore it becomes more gear dependent to play it the same way you used to, with easy examples being something like the Kensa Fire Shop Pro requires three mains and four subs at this point. I think the Dually Squelchers require three main, five or six sub. One of those to reach 99.9. A lot of people, I think, only go for 99.6, I think it is. So basically, if you want to run a three shot build on something like that weapon, you would have to sacrifice basically every other slot on the weapon. And another common one you'll see is Paint Radius nerfs, where they just straight up nerf the output of paint the weapon has, therefore making it worse at you know, building special. By nerfing paint, they make a weapon worse at contesting something like, you know, the zone, it's worse at stalling, and, you know, nerfing the ink efficiency of a main weapon also indirectly nerfs that, so a lot of the times when you combine those, it ends up really being a lot. Especially, you know, if you get more than one of these nerfs, then you're going to take a reasonable hit, is what I'm getting at. Okay, so now let's go over some of the weapons that I think were meta-defining throughout their own individual periods in the game's history and see how exactly the developers nerfed them in order to make them feel more balanced. And there is a dangerous prospect to balancing, that is, because a lot of the times nerfs in this game are more so addressed at top-level play. So, you know, it isn't uncommon that you'll see a player wonder why something is getting nerfed or why something is getting buffed. They'll often ask why is this getting nerfed if they think it's balanced in their mind because they don't see the true strengths of it. Or they may ask why is this getting buffed because they view it as a strong option. And I think a common example of that is a casual player may think that a weapon such as the Clash Posture is better than it actually is. And a lot of the time patches will have an influence not only on competitive play and may decrease the usage of a weapon that is very prevalent. You know, this affects players of all skill levels to some extent. I think the easiest example I like to go back to when I'm just discussing this kind of thing with my friends is how they nerfed the Dually Squelcher in this game, because it was a weapon that definitely deserved the kinds of nerfs it got, but as a consequence of the fact that it became far less ink efficient with both the main weapon and the rolling and having smaller bullet size, in addition to more expensive specials, and if you wanted to run main power, you basically had no other gear. It felt like Dually Squelcher, the missile one specifically, it used to be incredibly common in solo queue. I felt like there were many casual players that I would see on a normal basis using that weapon, and this was before the missile meta really took into effect in this game. So it stands to me as a really good example of how, you know, something may be justified in terms of it getting nerfed, but it can really affect every level of play and how a person enjoys a weapon, and I think that's going to be a big point that I want to focus on with these nerfs to the three weapons that I'm using for an example in this video. So the first weapon I'm going to talk about is the Explosher because this is one I have a lot of personal experience with. 
the first LAN event I ever won for Splatoon 2, I played Vanilla Exposure, and this was at the absolute peak of its strength. It was very shortly after it came out. People really didn't view it as a super strong option yet. It was before any of the nerfs to the main weapon, nerfs to bubbles that came shortly after any of that. So I have a very good perspective of Exposure at its absolute peak potency versus now where I think it's still a viable option, but considerably weaker than what it once used to be. So, okay, let me let me paint a picture for you if you haven't experienced. I wouldn't say peak Exposure meta, but I would say the vanilla Exposure meta specifically. I don't even know if I want to call it a meta necessarily, I want to just... Let's just call it Exposure, vanilla Exposure specifically, custom didn't exist yet, we didn't even have Ballpoint Nouveau back then either. But let's just, let's set the scene for you if you were hypothetically playing in this specific patch when they just dropped vanilla Exposure like I was at that LAN event that I won. So imagine you're just vibing on the map, you're existing, playing Splatoon 2, having a, a grand old time. And you see an Exposure on the enemy team, and they're sitting behind a wall that's pretty difficult to contest. The best thing you can do because, say, your short range weapon is that you can throw a bomb at them to make them move. Okay. So what's the Exposure going to do from back there? Well, Exposure at the time was a very extreme weapon that we hadn't really seen before in the game. Because, like all other Exposures, it kind of breaks map geometry. It's free to just stand behind a wall and shoot a hitbox above the wall and have it come down on the other side. So they're at a very safe position. They are experiencing very low risk and very high reward with what the weapon could do. Imagine the perspective of you're playing the game and you see an exposure on the enemy team. You know what that weapon is probably going to do at that point. It's a weapon with a very long reach, can sit behind a wall, has no fall off damage. If it directs you, it deals 90 damage. It's incredibly good at painting, incredibly good at stalling the zone. And back when it was first introduced, it had an ink efficiency, I believe, of 9% per tank, which basically meant it had 11 shots in the ink tank without any form of ink efficiency like ink saver main, which is quite a lot given the firing rate of the weapon. Meanwhile, it's providing all this form of crossfire, all this paint, and being a very low risk weapon with a lot of high reward because it can create easy denials for your team not letting the enemy team approach by painting the really thick glob in front of them or on top of their feet, getting the AOE on them, the 90 damage basically guarantees a kill because the enemy's going to be trapped, especially if they're a slower weapon. If you're something like a dynamo or a rap and you get directed by an exposure, you may as well be done. So having a weapon with all these strengths in addition to the 11 shots in a singular ink tank and the paint output it had was kind of insane, but that wasn't even the full extent of it. Because you're thinking, okay, you know, it's 11 shots, but you know, eventually it's going to have to stop shooting, right? It's going to run out of ink. Well, that's kind of where the kit came in a bit, right? Back then it had a 190 bubble blower, and this was before it suffered any of the nerfs. So it retained all the strengths and had a 190 bubble. And I will tell you, this exposure variant was introduced to the game when Bubble Blower lingered for, I believe, 18 seconds on the map before the bubbles dissipated. They didn't get deflated or they didn't get popped, they sat there for 18 seconds. That's a long time. If your team sustains that, that's basically fair map control. And here's the thing, Exposure with 11 shots could easily paint for a bubble in those 11 shots. So Exposure was able to just play the game, have virtually no downtime, and use its special to get more map control. That could last a very long time. And when you use special in this game, you get all of your ink back. There was virtually no downtime on this weapon. I will tell you, from my experience at that LAN, our counter pick map was effectively always humpback zones. Every time because I was able to have an extremely low risk weapon with extremely high reward. I would sit in one part of the map, stall the zone with all of about two shots consistently, and the opponent would have to work so hard to stop that by either wasting all their bombs on me, having someone attempt to flank me, something like that. Humpback Splat Zones, even to this current day, is a lot of special spam and a lot of non-interactive gameplay. But I will tell you, there was virtually nothing like peak exposure meta because he had this weapon that could effectively hit a lot of angles that are awkward for many weapons on the map because it's a bucket by nature. It could also simultaneously get a lot of really important picks on that map. Low risk, insane reward. And because of the nature of Humpback Pump Track, the paint count, the special count, tends to be a lot higher than other maps. And I will tell you, with absolute certainty, that there were multiple games at LAN where I probably got upwards of 9 or more bubble blowers. 
in five minute games on humpback spot zones. And if you've played humpback spot zones, you know how easy it is to cheese a cap on that map. All you have to do is get the, the smallest, easiest bit of pressure, and you can probably cap the zone back. Through the use of maybe like two bombs, and maybe one expo shot. Sounds kind of unfun to fight, doesn't it? But Exposure meta didn't even necessarily stop there. If anything, Exposure meta only got better with the introduction of the custom Exposure. While that weapon couldn't output bubbles all the time, what it had instead was a baller. Baller on Exposure ended up fixing one of the weapon's worst aspects, which was its close quarters combat capability. Try saying that five times fast. Kind of hard. One of the worst aspects of Exposure is obviously its kill time. It is very, very slow. Even if you direct the opponent and get a second shot on them, it is incredibly slow compared to many weapons, especially shooters in this game. And this is a game with very, very quick kill times if the opponent has like proper aim and is using a weapon not named Undercover, basically. So Baller helped alleviate that a ton. Because now you had this weapon that could sit in the back, crossfire for a team, paint for a team, deny the enemy team, and if you even got on top of it, it had a baller now. And in addition to that, because Exposure does 90 damage on direct, even if you got right on top of it, the one place it's supposed to be its absolute weakest, you simply have good aim, aim at the opponent's feet, get 90 damage, and they're either stuck and might die through your baller explosion, or alternatively you can do what a lot of Exposure players did, which was you get the 90 damage on someone that's trying to flank you or something, and you pop baller, and you run up to them and squish them because they're stuck in this giant glob of paint that did 90 damage to them. And I kid you not, I lived through this. It was hilarious, <laughs> and some of the most fun I've ever had in this game. Japanese solo queue was absolutely dominated by Exposure and spot zones. I will tell you, it was very shortly after they redesigned the reef as a map into... It went from a one zone map into a two zone map. And what they did was, it, it effectively made it so that Exposure was able to stall the zone with either one or two shots while sitting on plat or bridge, basically. No commitment. Very little commitment, practically nothing. It was during that metagame that I went into solo queue with custom Exposure, thinking, I really like this weapon. It's very fun. I love having a weapon that can provide all these things to a team, have incredible team play. And, you know, it has a very defined weakness, but it had a tool to get around that. And it felt really good. It was satisfying, fun to play. Have you ever played Exposure? Have you ever landed a 90 on someone's head? Incredible feeling. Love it. Absolutely one of my favorites. And here I am stepping into solo queue with a weapon. I'm thinking like, yeah, this is cool. This is what I want to play. And I get into a lobby. I don't remember the exact average of the lobby. It's kind of whatever. It doesn't super matter. But it was a Japanese lobby. Probably at least 2,500 XP average, higher than that. And the lobby is composed 5 out of the 8 weapons for custom exposures on Reef Spot Sense. It was incredible. It was some of the stupidest fun I've ever had in this game, honestly, from a solo queue perspective. Have you ever heard of the game Battleship? Where effectively your opponent has boats on coordinates on a grid? and you list a coordinate in an attempt to hit their ship and figure out where it is and sink it. That's, that's basically how Exposure plays in Splatoon 2, especially at the peak of its meta, which I've been describing. They say, okay, that sounds oppressive, but really fun to play. So what did they do to nerf it? Is probably what you're asking. Well, Exposure received a lot of nerfs. First of all, it received a paint nerf where Depending on where the exposure is positioned and how high or low a shot is hitting affects how it paints. And this was a big one. Because it meant on a lot of maps where the exposure was allowed to just sit on an elevated plat by their spawn, or a very safe area that's hard to contest, if it did that, it carried a new risk, which is it's far worse at stalling zone. In addition to that, the first nerf being a nerf to its ability to stall and trap people in its paint. The next one also affects that. They changed the Exposure's ink efficiency from a base of 11 shots per tank to 8, and losing 3 out of 11 <laughs> is pretty brutal in addition to a raw painting nerf. So in addition to a paint nerf on the main weapon and a nerf to its ink efficiency making it have a lot more downtime than it used to, the Bulbular went from 190 to 210. And in addition to that, for several patches, Bubble Blower went from about 18 seconds of duration on the field 
down to, I believe it was 12 at its lowest. I think it's 14 seconds now, but still a six second duration cut on its special and it hit into a plus 20. And custom specifically had its baller, I forget what it was when it first dropped. I think it was 190. I want to say it's 210 now or 220, something like that. But in addition to that, Exposure got explicitly nerfed in a patch. They introduced an entire mechanic to the game over two years since its release with the baller special, making it such that lightweight baller weapons have more ability to turn and basically more flexibility with what they do in baller. But in exchange for that, custom Exposure's baller a lost ability to move and turn, and this isn't even to get into how many times Baller has been nerfed in this game. But yeah, to say the least, Exposure has been hit a ton. And the craziest part to me is despite all of that, I don't think it's a bad weapon. It's still quite good. It has such unique strengths to it. And when put on a team comp with a weapon such as a neo splash matic or a Tendabrella specifically in zones, I think it's very good. But this is to kind of illustrate the kind of lengths that the dev team is willing to go to to nerf strong options in this game, at least uh, the ones I'm going to go over. We'll, we'll, we'll get to the shortcomings of what I think the balance patches have been kind of lacking for a bit. But overall, Exposure is one of my favorite weapons that I've seen in either of the two games, and it's one of my favorite weapons in any game, honestly. It's incredibly unique. It has such a defined set of strengths and a very, very defined weakness. So even though it can feel like absolute nonsense on maps like Camp Triggerfish Zones, you know, I, I think that's more of an issue of map design where they didn't really design camp with Exposure in mind because that weapon didn't exist in Splatoon 1. But you know, when it comes to a map such as Reef Spot Zones or Gobi Spot Zones or really anything where an exposure can effectively stall and crossfire and create a lot of pressure in such a unique way, I, I, I really do love the weapon. And I think it's a really good example of the kind of unique weapons that Splatoon is capable of having. Alright, so the second weapon that I'm picking as an example, again from Splatoon 2, because this is a video about Splatoon 2 that's kind of a given, that we're going to talk about is the Sorella Barrel, which is the cutest weapon in the game, and I will fight you about that. This weapon changes in colors with your own ink. Have you have you played like a Splatfest with this weapon? It is aesthetic for any ink color that you're playing. It is perfect. I love it. But that aside, Sorella Barrel is kind of an interesting case because Brella, the vanilla Brella kit has existed for a long time in this game before Sorella Brella got introduced, and honestly, when Sorella, Sorella Brella, that's difficult to say. When Sorella Barella first dropped into the game, I wasn't a big fan purely because it had an autobomb. And back when the weapon first dropped, autobomb wasn't really a very good sub weapon. I think the dev team did a good job of balancing autobomb later on in the game. When the game first dropped, autobomb, I believe, was 70% of your ink tank, had more white ink, which means more cooldown before you could recover ink after throwing it. I think it took longer to start tracking a player, it was far more reactable. And I believe there was a thing with it. If an autobomb was tracking you early on in the game before they did one patch, uh, it, it took, I don't, I don't remember how long exactly, it was probably like upwards of like five seconds if not longer before the autobomb would just stop walking and explode. So you're wasting most of your ink tank to get kind of delayed information on a less lethal bomb than a lot of other bombs such as Splat Bomb and Suction Bomb. And oftentimes it wouldn't even paint until a long time after the fact. You know, that, that aside, skipping over to when the autobomb actually became a good sub-weapon for Brella, I, you know, I quite liked it. Because one of Brella's defining weaknesses in this game is it is very susceptible to sharking. If it is in disadvantage, it struggles immensely with quick kill time weapons that are sitting in awkward corners that Brella is not ready to hit. And autobomb kind of alleviated that weakness because it gave you the information that you want. You could throw an autobomb at a ledge or under a ledge and see where it goes. You could tell if someone is sitting there waiting for you or not. That's pretty cool, right? You have a spot bomb rush, which I think synergized with the weapon very well. It created a it created a ton of pressure because you have this weapon that's capable of stalling, two shotting with a very good aim. That could kind of one v one a lot of weapons uniquely. It can kind of sort of bully shooters. It could bully a lot of weapons that you really wouldn't ordinarily be able to, and if not bully, just simply disengage with them. And the bomb rush was kind of its X factor in a way because it forced people to respect the space in addition to that. With the damage values it has, 
it was possible, it still is possible, but it was easier back then to combat the damage off a spot bomb, you know, to get kills on people, you know, maybe multi kills, you know. It, it was. It's, it's such a unique weapon, it's so fun, and it really. You know, it wasn't a perfect hit by any means, but I feel like it had all the tools on this Rallabarla kit to really get what the weapon wanted. And it was incredibly unique, no other weapon could even say it plays remotely the same. I don't even think there's another auto bomb weapon in the game that has a bomb rush as good as a uh, spot bomb rush. You know, that was cool. I liked it a ton, I still do like it. And it was interesting to me, because when the initial Barla came out, it was super under-tuned at launch. I'm talking... Uh, it. I, I, I can't even go into it without taking too long in this video because I'm already rambling for so long. But I'll, I'll link the page in the description where you can read the patch notes for what they did to a normal Barla, because essentially it was a non-functional weapon until, I believe, version 1.3 or 1.4. I'm, I'm blanking on which one it is, but it was not very good. The devs gave it a 160 rain to compensate for the fact the main weapon was so undertuned back then. So, okay, what, what did they do to this weapon? Honestly, the amount of changes on this weapon isn't nearly as many as Exposure, I feel. It can be boiled down to simply the weapon got a painting nerf, which again makes it worse at contesting other weapon classes in terms of raw paint. It got ink efficiency nerfs, which gave it more cooldown, had to be more careful with how it throws bomb, how it fights, how long it stalls, that kind of deal. Plus 20 to its bomb rush's cost. So you went from Brella being able to run special charge and having upwards of like 7, 8, if not more bomb rushes a game on a weapon that had potential two shots, a lot of stalling, and perfectly good kill potential if you were good with aiming and spacing with it, you went from that to maybe with the ink efficiency nerfs and the plus 20, honestly it felt like every time I played that weapon it would be a miracle if I hit 7. 7 would be like a pop-off game basically <laughs> with that weapon. But I think the biggest nerf they did to Brella is one that on paper it sounds okay. I can see where the developers were coming from with this, but in practice I feel like the culmination of all these nerfs made it very difficult to play effectively. And that nerf is the damage nerf. Brella before the damage nerf, if you hit every pellet, it would cap out at 90 damage. And what was insane about that was if you hit the 90 damage on someone, as long as you get one pellet, a singular pellet after that, it would kill them every single time. As long as it wasn't like a max range fall pellet or some nonsense, it was easy. You could basically go into a fight, get a perfect first shot, and your your next shot could be the sloppiest thing in the universe, and as long as a single pellet hits, that fight is yours. <laughs> and it was pretty insane. So when it happened, you know, I kind of sat there and I lamented it. But I thought, you know, I, I, I get it. You don't, you don't want a weapon that has, you know, a pretty good kit, the ability to stall all these weapons, bully these weapons in 1v1s. And you don't want it to con consistently two shot in a low committal fashion if you get a perfect first shot. Fine. I got it. It's fair. But again, I think it's the thing where the combination of all these nerfs made a weapon with a very difficult skill floor to get past even more difficult, which turned a lot of people off. You'll often hear people ask, you know, where are the Brawl players? It's just, it's a very difficult weapon to play. Especially in this meta, which you know we'll get into again, but to me it felt like the nerfs only really raise that skill floor. You know, if you're playing perfect with Brawl, you can still do fantastically, but it has such defined weaknesses in this game. Again, it struggles with sharkers, its painting isn't as good, its ink efficiency isn't excellent, it wants to run all this mobility because it's a very short range weapon. It is very short range. In order to consistently two shot someone, you have to be basically hugging them, you have to hold their hand. So it felt like a kind of weapon that had a very defined risk-reward ratio, where if it got the plays it wanted, it got into the ranges it wanted, it could bully anything it wanted to, basically. But it had to work hard to get in, that was the thing. It had no like free approach tool, really. And it could be overwhelmed in fights where it's, you know, trying to fight two people at once or three people at once, you know? And I think additional buffs to things like Suction Bomb, where Suction Bomb's damage got increased from, I believe, was at 180 pre-patch, I think to 220, because of the multiplier on Brawl Shield, Brawl Shield has 500 HP, I think it does 440 damage to Brawl Shield, so... You know, having this weapon have these cons to it, and you have to work hard to get exactly what you want, but then you have really easy to play weapons such as NZAP and K-Shot. They have the ability to just hit the R button at the shield basically, and then pretty much anything would break the shield. Kinda didn't feel the greatest to me. And it's not even to mention, I think Brawl's 
Brawl's probable worst weakness in this game was just simply the netcode. The netcode is not good in this game. So to have a high execution skill for weapon, receive all these nerfs kind of just turns a lot of people off and even the most dedicated of Brawl players can grow really frustrated with it and I, I get it. It's like playing Brawl in this game feels like trying to play Sheik towards the end of Smash 4. You have so many tools. You're such a good character. You can oppress so many characters in so many ways. But even the slightest slip up is going to get you killed. But to me, Brella is a completely unique weapon that, again, I can't say any other game has really ever offered me. And it's one of my favorite things, even if it is really difficult to play right now. And it's really, at this point, it's one of the only weapons I super duper like in this game, honestly. And, you know, thinking back to the Smash 4 example, I say with, you know, Sheik, where it's like, she was pretty much definitively a top tier, but not many people really used her at top level toward the end of the game's life because of her difficulty. And just sort of the risk reward is sometimes she really literally gets blown up by rage and dying at like 30%. It was, it was it was funny to watch, but it's really painful to watch because it's understandable. And I say this as someone who my favorite character in Smash 4 is probably Sheik. So, you know, going from Sheik. She Sheik and Brawl have a lot of similarities, honestly. Now, now that I'm thinking about it out loud while well, just kind of going off my script and just on tangents about whatever comes to mind, really. Okay, so the last example weapon I'm going to use is, again, from Splatoon 2. The weapon I really like. And honestly, the weapon that when it defined the meta, it was probably my favorite meta in this entire game, which is a massive compliment in a way, because there have been a lot of metas that were not my favorite, let's put it that way. And that weapon's the ballpoint spotlighting. Now this weapon, if you've experienced it at its peak, it was a hundred percent overtuned. It did so much in one team slot, it was absolutely unreasonable. In its prime, this weapon basically had it all. It was an anchor that could play aggressively, didn't share the traditional weakness a lot of anchors have, or if they have a player flank them or get on top of them, that they're basically doomed because of the weapon's modifiers are short range and long range. The short range is incredibly good for painting, you had high mobility, the kill time is very quick, your strafe is good, your long range mode is very good at cross firing, and it is deceptive because the weapon can recharge in very quick intervals. You know, it looks like the spotlight is out of bolts, but then they just, you know, pull the button a little bit and they have a few more bolts. It, it was very deceptive. And ad in addition to those strengths, Ballpoint had a totally unique kit in this game. And it's something, if you've been at my streams long enough, it's something I complain about in this game all the time, which is I love Squid Beacon as a concept sub in this game, but there are simply not many good options with it. Outside of Ballpoint Nouveau and Tentabrella, I think every other Squid beacon weapon in this game is either straight up bad or incredibly niche on like a couple of maps. So to have only two weapons really in this game that ever really had defined metas, well okay, that's being a little bit unfair to Red Dapple on pre-patch Shell and Durf, but that's, you know, if, if you if you know, you know. If you don't know, just pretend it doesn't exist, we don't need to talk about it, you know, don't worry about it. I lived it. You, you don't have to. That's all you need to know. But beacons. Beacons are a really cool sub in this game because they function as a utility sub, and oftentimes in this game, especially in the current meta, the name of the game is Bomb Spam. So having a utility sub actually offer so much to a team by being jump-ins was really, really cool to me. Even in Splatoon 1, you didn't really see a lot of beacon weapons. There was the occasional e-leader, custom e-leader 4k scope, I guess, but outside of that you really didn't see a ton of it at like higher level, especially at the end game state of Splatoon 1. So to have a weapon that clearly defined the metagame for so long, had the sub weapon felt really refreshing in a way. I, I liked it a ton. And I think there were a ton of cool combos you could do with it. You could do three really aggressive weapons with ballpoint, and you could get kind of creative with it. Uh, I was talking about this with a friend yesterday before I recorded this script after I, I wrote it a bit, and I was kind of just rambling out my thoughts. And I said, you know, I think Tetra is a really cool weapon in Splatoon 2, but I don't think it fits the, the style of play Splatoon 2 has, especially now. And we were talking about when we thought Tetra was at its peak. And I said, I think Tetra's best time in this game was during ballpoint meta, because it had the ability to just jump in, take the risky plays akin to spot one QR, go for something crazy. If it works out, awesome. Then you can get something going. If not, okay, you know, whatever. You proc your QR, that's fine. Jump back into a beacon or to your teammate. No big deal. And I thought that was really cool. That's a really cool aspect of, of Splatoon 2. Uh, all, all the meanwhile, the weapon had Ink Storm, which is kind of a sleeper special in a way, because there aren't really a ton of weapons that were meta with Ink Storm. You know, you could say like V Brawler for a period, CDS probably the best example outside of Ballpoint. Ink Storm always felt like a really balanced special to me. 
because it has a clear strength. But its weakness is the fact that obviously you can't build another until the first one's over. And generally speaking, I think that's how specials should be designed. We'll talk on more, that more later with the two specials I think are the best in the game, and neither of them has that weakness. We'll, we'll get to it. But, you know, basically Ballpoint had it all. The only thing it was really bad at was its long range paint wasn't very good, and it was awkward in the mid range because you wanted to, you know, say say you want to hit someone at squeezer range or spire shot per range. You can't really use short range mode without risking trading or being like hugging the opponent. And if you use long range, you lose a lot of your mobility. It's kind of awkward because you have that startup, especially if you're in short mode painting. So, you know, the weapon was kind of awkward. Sometimes you felt like your, your timings were off, but you know, overall it was just a really powerful weapon and it used to have the main power curve on it where it could three shot people in addition to having the rain. You know, I think it was even to the point where I, I think in one of the Japanese tournaments I watched, uh, there was a team that, I don't know if they won the whole thing, but they ran Ballpoint Nouveau, Ballpoint Nouveau, H3D, H3D, and all of them had main power. So you're risking getting two shot by two H3s with suction armor and you're risking getting three shot by two ballpoints with two sets of beacons and two rains. And it was very, very, very funny. <laughs> but here's the thing, Ballpoint got nerfed a lot. Maybe even more than Exposure. Honestly, there's so many. Again, I'm gonna link the page in the description. You can read it in depth for yourself. But you know, we're just gonna we're just gonna lightning around it because we, we, we want to get to the to the meat. You know, Keen, what's what's wrong with the current meta? What what don't you like about it? You're just rambling about all these old metas and your old, old memories, kind of thing. Ballpoint had a nerf to its run speed. Its run speed curve got nerfed. Main power, the curve got nerfed initially, so it needed more main power in order to three shot people. And then eventually, they nerfed the base damage on the weapon, which is a very big nerf in itself. And it was to the point where main power basically no longer three shot. So every ball point in the world that knew what they were doing immediately dropped main power. It had no use anymore. If you wanted to break armor in one hit with your 28 damage, you had to run object shredder. Okay, you know, whatever. Special cost. Ballpoint has the absolute privilege of being one of two weapons in this game that ever hit 230 special costs, the highest of anything in the game. 230. The only other weapon was Tenetek Splatter Shot. And even to this day, as I wrote this script and as I'm recording this, it's still 220. In addition to that, Ballpoint got a long range painting nerf when you, it's long range mode when you're jumping has increased spread, which means it was less accurate if you're jumping in long range mode. And you know, with all those nerfs in mind, the weapon was already starting to fall off a bit. I think it was still decent, but the devs continued to nerf it, which I, I didn't think the last wave of nerfs was necessary in this weapon. I think that was really just like kind of unnecessary. And in that last patch for Ballpoint when they nerfed it, they nerfed its bullet velocity, which made it far more reactable to fight at long ranges. And it, but not only that, that's a huge nerf in itself. A lot of weapons in this game had their bullet velocity buffed. You know, like Spire Shot Pro at launch had very slow bullets and they made it faster. That is a huge nerf. But in addition to that, they gave Ballpoint a range nerf. Not a whole ton, but a range nerf. And a range nerf is one of the worst things you can suffer in this game because all of a sudden, all these weapons you were once able to bully at certain ranges, you either can't touch anymore or you straight up lose to them. It is incredibly bad. It's so bad and so rare that the only other range nerf I can imagine on a weapon that happened in this game was Trislosher. But that, if you live that when the game was new, you know why that happened. It was very, very, very stupid. <laughs> oh, and you know, on top of that, by the way, I didn't even mention. In the very last patch of the nerf ballpoint, they gave it another run speed nerf because, you know, it's just going too fast. Mobility is too good. We got to nerf it a second time. That's necessary. Definitely needed to do that. And. Crazier than this still, despite having like a full page of nerfs, I still think the weapon isn't even bad. But again, this is just to give you a taste of the kind of patches that I've sort of grown to expect in Splatoon 2, when the developers really think something is actually problematic for the game. When they say a weapon is dominating the metagame, it seems to me that the developers are very willing to nerf the ever-living heck out of them. Even if their are new weapons introduced into, and I think all these weapons are exceptionally interesting, but that didn't stop them from nerfing them as hard as they did. You're probably thinking, okay, Keen, if they're willing to nerf weapons this hard, surely, surely they wouldn't let an easy to play weapon that's been in Splatoon since the first game that has practically no legitimate weaknesses and serves as a really overbearing presence in this metagame, surely they wouldn't let it just thrive 
when that weapon sits in the most basic weapon class that this game has to offer. And then proceed to troll the player base by nerfing it in a means that is basically a slap on the wrist and nothing more. Surely they wouldn't leave that weapon to dominate the entire endgame of Splatoon 2. Okay, so we've talked about how the developers have nerfed a ton of my favorite weapons in a ton of different ways, and how I don't even think they're necessarily bad after that, but you know, again, if the developers are willing to nerf all these unique weapons that are brand new, that have completely unique playstyles to them, so that their weaknesses are more apparent or their strengths are toned down slightly, you know, it you can't particularly blame me for expecting a bit more willingness to shift a metagame if it's gotten particularly stagnant. Because here's the thing, I didn't think Ballpoint, Explosher, or Brella metagame was stagnant. I thought they were interesting, but it didn't stop them from changing it. Which is fine, you know, not all, not all your favorites are going to be top tiers. Nothing wrong with that. What I have a problem with is when a metagame is a result of a game filled to the brim with a ton of options that have been severely nerfed leaving it so that basically the entire metagame is defined by weapons that received practically nothing but buffs the entirety of the game's life. Even if those weapons didn't necessarily need those buffs. Generally speaking, in this game, a lot of weapons tend to have really polarizing strengths and really polarizing weaknesses. We can take Hydra's Spotlight as an example because it's got absolutely insane DPS and ability to just mow through people. That's a strength but it's completely offset by the fact that the weapon is incredibly stationary, has a long charge time, is a heavyweight weapon, and is incredibly susceptible to being forced to move and lose its charge through the use of bombs, stingray, and missile. That's an easy example. In fact, I haven't even really talked about specials a whole ton in this video yet, and the reason for that is I want to talk about something that I think contributes to a problem in the current meadow spot. Let's go over the concept of risk versus reward. Ideally, you want to balance a game in such a way that weapons that have a higher risk to them with very defined weaknesses, such as Hydra Spotlight or Tenderbola, you want to balance them in such a way that the weapon still feels good to use at their peaks. If the weapons don't feel good at their peaks, then no one's going to want to play them. That's a simple thing that applies to basically every game. You know, why am I going to pick awkward low tier I have to sink 50 hours into the game into, only to realize they're still at low tier? People don't really want to do that, necessarily, especially if they want to win, they're not going to bother. These weapons with extremely polarizing designs that are capable of doing plays that other weapons simply cannot do, such as Tenebrel's ability to walk into something like a 1v3 and survive, or make an opportunity for their team through the use of the Tent Shield, or by sheer distraction power and quick respawn and forcing the opponent to throw three bombs and a special at it to kill it, you know, that's something completely unique to it, and that's something I love. I thought. I think that's incredibly interesting. It can be frustrating to fight at its strengths, but when the weapon's at its weakest, it falters. A lot. But here's the thing. When you nerf the greatest strengths of a weapon hard enough, the risk-reward of that weapon becomes incredibly skewed. The risk versus reward becomes more skewed toward risk than it is toward reward. When I was talking about Exposure's strengths and its risk versus reward, it had incredibly low risk and incredibly good reward. But when you apply all the nerfs that I talked about to it, its reward diminishes greatly. And the risks only get worse when you nerf the few options that they have, such as the Exposure's Heavy Baller. Getting a Heavy Baller after having a Normal Baller is a very big increase to its risk factor. A lot of scenarios back in pre-patches, before Baller's startup nerf, before its heavy Baller, before all the damage multipliers were increased on Baller, before any of that. All of those culminate to make a weapon that can feel frustrating to play. That can be more trouble than it feels like it's worth. It can go from a weapon that defines the metagame to one that is only a niche, and an awkward niche at that because it's such an unusual, different weapon. It becomes a question of if you're brand new to the game right now, and you like Exposure, and you want to try it out, you want to play it at a competitive level, 
the skill floor required to make that weapon work after the the wave of nerfs it's received is much higher than it used to be which isn't inherently bad but it it becomes a less and less appealing option for a player to choose if they want to win if i'm building a team comp and we put a tent on our team it's very possible my team is going to get overwhelmed by bomb spam special spam or simply a ton of weapons with good frame data that can ignore the Tentabrala and just leave it to its own device and just go in a different direction. If I pick an Explosher on my team, we might suffer because we lost one of our four team slots of weapons to a weapon that's kits don't really offer a ton because they've been nerfed in numerous different ways, and Explosher's kits aren't the reason it used to be good. They were part of it, but they didn't define it. You're probably thinking now, okay, Keen, I get it. Risk versus reward. So naturally, top tiers in a game are probably going to be the options that have low risk and really high reward. And you'd be right. The entire meta is defined by weapons that have incredibly low risk and incredibly high reward. Here's the thing with that. They aren't polarizing weapons. They aren't the weapons that I find particularly interesting. The answer... So what defines this meta is the same one we started at the beginning of the video with, and the word is shooters. Shooters in Splatoon 2 have the least defined weakness of any weapon class, bar none. It is, by nature, a rounded weapon class that will never experience the lows that something like Tenebrella would, or a Hydra would, or a Dynamo would. People that play shooters that don't touch other weapon classes don't really truly understand the perspective that a lot of non-shooter players are coming from when they say they're frustrated, especially in this metagame. When I talk to other players that I know that play weapons that aren't shooters, a lot of them are a bit frustrated because they feel incredibly overwhelmed having to constantly fight teams composed of all of these low-risk high reward weapons. It's doable for a weapon such as Explosher, Ballpoint. Tentabrella, Slaprella, Soda Slosher, any of them. It's doable. But is it fun? Is it fun having to play a weapon that's so much more difficult to play, only to get denied by a weapon that simply has better options that are lower risk? Is it fun to pick a weapon that you know at its prime had better tools that would have let you maybe win that fight, survive that interaction. Cap the zone. Anything. It doesn't feel good. It really doesn't. And here's the thing. Shooters lack a tangible weakness, which isn't inherently bad. But these weapons possess so much as a result of the reverse power creep. Because of the examples I gave amidst many, many others, a lot of options in Splatoon 2 have been nerfed heavily. Shooters, on the other hand, generally speaking, for the most part, have not really been nerfed. If anything, they've only gotten better. The developers were very adamant about some of them just simply not really being nerfed, and even if they were, they oftentimes got reverted. Such as NSAP used to have a 210 armor, but then they brought it back down to 200. It didn't need that necessarily, but they gave it to it. I never thought Junior was a bad option, but the developers gave it a big ink tank because players were simply using more ends up, and they were using more H3. Did the Junior necessarily need a big ink tank? I don't think it did. But it got this huge buff. The strengths of shooters are generally speaking that the best of them have incredibly good frame data with a lack of end lag. They're able to shoot simply a few bullets and rotate immediately. They don't have to commit to longer animations, such as a lot of the heavy AI weapons like Dynamo and Tentabrawl. They don't have to deal with that. Their mobility and movement options are simply better in many, many, many regards. And oftentimes they'll be able to rotate near instantly, especially with swim speed builds. Swim speed is huge. Mobility is a huge thing in this game, so not having it is a crippling weakness. And I think everyone's experienced that when they play a weapon with like clunkier frame data. They want to fight someone. That's a shooter. They miss their one opportunity and the shooter simply moves, deletes them with their quick kill time, goes on with their life, goes to do something else on the map instantly. And you know, going back to Junior, the strengths of that weapon versus the weaknesses, the risk versus reward, 
The risk of Junior is that it's a short range weapon. It's inaccurate. You're never really going to jump with it because its jump accuracy is terrible. But the reward you get for picking that weapon by comparison given how easy it is to play feels incredibly skewed because you have a big ink tank which gives you more ink efficiency by default on a weapon that's already the most ink efficient in the entire game. I think Junior can quite literally sit there for 20 seconds holding the ZR button without any form of ink efficiency whatsoever. And that's not even accounting for if you run a, a, a build with last ditch effort and it's in full effect, which is its whole... last ditch effort is a whole ordeal in itself that I could honestly cover in another video if people are interested, but I don't know if people want to listen to me ramble about that. If, if you want to see that, you know, comment it. I can make a video, we'll talk about it. I want to see how this one does, I want to... If people are more interested in discussion videos, I can easily, like, do these. I find these more, more interesting at the moment than playing the game, honestly. And, you know, I've lived through years of this game, so I, I have a ton I can tell you or teach you if you really want to know. But, you know, Junior's Risk Reward is kind of skewed because it is, in the purest sense of the word, I think it's a spammer weapon. <laughs> it is a very spammy, annoying, frustrating to play weapon. And conversations I have with people kind of boil down to that, where they say the Junior is basically not interacting. But they're getting so much mileage through their raw paint, bomb spam, and 180 ink armor. And it's, it's a difficult thing to say because I would never call the weapon overpowered necessarily, but I wouldn't call it amazing design, if that makes sense. In a game filled to the brim with weapons that have incredibly defined periods of end lag, downtime, lack of ink efficiency, Junior Stance is the polar opposite, where it has among the best mobility, the best ink efficiency, arguably one of the best kits in the entire game. And its only defined weakness is something that it can kind of work around with its bomb, its mobility, its armor. It has the tools to do that. But it gets so much mileage without having to interact a whole ton. Which I think exemplifies how a lot of this metagame has shaped out to be. I think there are two specials in this game that clearly stand out as the best specials in this game right now. And they have been for a very long time, honestly. And they perfectly exemplify the concept of risk versus reward. And that is ink armor and tenta missiles. I talked earlier about how a ballpoint at its worst had to suffer a 230 rain. There are still plenty of weapons that had to suffer special cost nerfs because of previous metagames that have never been fixed. Range Blaster still sits at 200 rain, which I think is ludicrous. I think there's no reason for it to be sitting at a special cost at high when you have options such as K-Shot and Junior sitting at 180. It is nonsensical in my mind. Given the kit discrepancy and the main weapon differences, it is mind-boggling that these weapons are even in the same game, honestly. But Ink Armor and Tenta Missile are the epitome of incredibly low risk, practically none, with extreme potential reward. If you have a bad armor and you don't necessarily get a team pick, it's still fine. Through the use of armor, you can still gain map control because the opponent is forced to respect you. If you have a bad missile that doesn't necessarily result in a kill or a push, that's fine. It is a cheap cost, you can build another one immediately, and even through the use of a quote unquote bad missile, you have gained information. You now know where the entire enemy team is sitting, and you, you can keep track of that for multiple seconds if you want to sit there in the missile just to keep an eye on them. It's insane. And both of these specials are among the cheapest to build in the entire game. And here's the thing, I mentioned earlier Inkstorm, you cannot build another one until the first one has dissipated. With missiles, you can immediately build the second you launch your first set of missiles. It is a legitimate strategy to throw a suction bomb on something like a splatter shot or a flings it before you pop missile. Pop the missile, the suction bomb blows up, all that suction paint contributes to your next missile. And there's a similar case with ink armor, being that you can't build it until the user of the ink armor has had their armor knocked off. And because you have it on all these like very, very mobile, very low risk weapons like Junior and NSAP, they're completely capable and oftentimes they can completely abuse that. If a Junior pops an armor and knows they're not going to commit to a fight too hard to the point where they don't need the armor, they can perfectly willingly just 
get hit by a hitbox that they know won't kill them, knock off their armor so they can go and farm another. It's an actual strategy that people can do. And I can't say I like it, because it can be legitimately valid. The thing with missiles is missiles have been buffed a numerous amount of times. When missiles first came out in this game, they possessed pretty much the same strengths, but they lacked the option to rotate with them. You couldn't swim and then reposition. To get better markings, you were kind of committing to using the missile. And in addition to that, the end lag on missile at launch was unbearable. You can go to the single player in hero mode, play I think the second or third level in the game, use missile on like four targets. It's insanely slow. It's over a full second, if not more. It is painfully slow. But by making missiles have that new option, by making them have virtually no end lag, you've indirectly made it far more spammable, far more easy to follow up on, and far more valuable. The risk reward has been skewed immensely for missile through patches, that before you had the initial risk of I may pop a bad missile because I can't rotate to a position at all, I'm forced to sit here in the animation and missile whoever I think I can, you know, I had more risk with that. But it had less reward because there's so much end lag to shooting at missiles. You may not even, you know, get to the opponent in time to follow up or force a fight on them. If I sat here right now and I asked you, the viewer, to try and find me high to top level scrims in Splatoon 2 in the current meta with team compositions that are serious about winning and they don't have a armor or a missile, I'd be legitimately impressed. I genuinely think every team that's trying to win right now has a combination of one or the two, if not both, and sometimes even multiple. We've seen instances of double armor, we've seen instances of double missile. It's not uncommon. And here's the thing. The most low risk high reward specials in the game are armor and missile. That much is true. This much we know for sure. The lowest risk highest reward weapon class in the game is shooters. They lack a, a tangible weakness. So combine these. What are you left with? You're left with a metagame filled to the brim with weapons that lack tangible weaknesses, that can simply stall the game pain to play on their own terms safely, that can simply wait for armor plus missile in order to make a play happen, because the combination of knowledge about where the enemy team is quickly, hitboxes going to land on top of them and having an armor to win the team fight is simply the most low risk, high reward strategy you can probably have in this game right now. And it's how you win. It's why most team comps look that way. In terms of risk reward with sub weapons, we're this far into the video. I think you have a good idea about what the most low risk high reward sub weapons in the game are. And that's lethal bomb, spot bomb, and zucted bomb. The ability to hit the R button in order to deny space, potentially guarantee kills with additional pressure, get random kills on unaware opponents. Those things are just so powerful, I, I cannot overstate it enough. There is a reason that practically every team comp trying to win in tower control will run at least two suction bombs, if not a minimum of one. Because in tower control, you're forced to ride the tower. What's the easiest way to stop it? You can throw bombs at it, to stall it, to force them on specific parts of the tower. If I throw a bomb on the left side of the tower pole, the opponent's forces down the right side, it becomes even easier to kill them. What are they going to do about it? They have to stand on it to win. Not a ton you can do about that. Virtually every weapon in this meta that is defining the game that lacks a lethal bomb as other incredibly potent strengths, but still remains a shooter class weapon. Because again, even if you take the bombs out of the picture, low risk, high reward is the name of the game if you're trying to win. And by nerfing a lot of the more niche, specialist, difficult to play options, it only encourages more and more people to go to what wins, to go to the easy weapon, to go to one of the few remaining viable weapons because they have not been nerfed in ways that are detrimental to their playstyle and skew that risk reward in such a way that sometimes it doesn't feel like it's worth playing those options. Yet somehow, in spite of all of the things that I've just told you about the importance of kits, the power of lethal bombs, the power of the two best specials in the game, my least favorite weapon balance-wise in this entire game that remains in this patch is still a weapon that possesses neither those bombs, neither that special. This weapon is the embodiment of one of the most skewed risk to reward ratios I have ever seen in the entirety of Splatoon 2. This weapon possesses good frame data by nature of being a shooter, it has good paint output, a still cheap special cost at 190 on a shooter, which is practically nothing. 
good ink efficiency allowing it to use its wall to reduce its risk further and increase its reward when it creates space for itself with a team, often in combination with armor and missile. 52 by nature is a shooter brella that is easier to play, that has a kit that exacerbates its strengths even more. It is a map presence you quite simply cannot ignore in this game, because in addition to all of those strengths, being a shooter, it possesses one of the quickest kill times in the entire game. Consistently. So consistently that sometimes you get jumping two shot at mid-range weapon reach. All the while this weapon has insane safety. Every tool that it could possibly need in order to make a selfish play and either guarantee it creates space or gets a multi-kill really quickly. Remember that part of the video where I talked about Brella, my favorite weapon? how the devs nerfed its ink efficiency. They nerfed the cost of its special. They nerfed its paint output. They nerfed its ability to get two shots consistently, despite the fact that Brella has a far worse kill time than 52. Air sets a weapon that functionally plays quite similarly to Brella, but the risk reward and the ease of play is simply on another level. It is far easier to play. It is so much simpler to play. There is far less risk to this weapon, and honestly, there's more reward to it because it has the clutch factor of being able to get multi-kills very quickly with its kill time, all of the while being incredibly safe. The nerfs that many main weapons have suffered in Splatoon 2 have made it that it feels like you've reached a point where Kegel as a main weapon is incredibly oppressive because it possesses traits, all of the traits, that many weapons in the game have lost to some capacity. Many weapons have lost ink efficiency. They've lost kill power. They've lost gear slots. That's another thing about this weapon. It's so self-sufficient, it really needs no gear slots. You're free to run basically anything you want. You can stack up on the speed, you can stack on main power to make it even more consistent and remove one of its only two tangible weaknesses, which is sometimes bad RNG and lacking a lethal bomb. And guess what? With a wall on your frame data, if you have bad RNG, if you die, you're probably just impatient. That's your fault, not the weapons. And no lethal bomb? Fine. Stick, a, stick an ends up on there, stick a K-shot on there. It's not hard. Another low risk, incredibly high reward weapon that pairs well with it and becomes incredibly oppressive. Why wouldn't you do that if you want to win? Seems pretty apparent to me based on pretty much every scrim I've done in the past couple months. But you know, it's okay. The devs nerf 52. Right? Yep, that's it. Went from 180 Booyah to 190. And it paints ever so slightly lost with the tip of its range, I guess. I don't even notice it, honestly. The nerf honestly might have uh, might as well not have happened. It didn't change how the weapon plays, it didn't change its strengths, it didn't change its weaknesses. Nothing changed from that patch. At all. This weapon has been dominating online play for quite a while, being uh, the most used weapon in X rank in pretty much every game mode. I'm serious. Check out the sendo.ink, I'll put it in the description. Uh, check out the tier list for the past few months. It's always Kegal at the top. Every single month. Go to Silver Usage Rates, it's always going to be up there. Little polka dot adorned atrocity of game design. Staring at me. Feels like it's mocking me because it's just an easier to play better version of the weapon I love the most in this game. It doesn't feel good. It really doesn't. I'm all for buffs over nerfs, but having this thing basically go untouched. While all the more interesting weapons to play and to watch for me as someone who loved BPM, who loves Brawl, who loves Exposure. Watching all of those get nerfed feels like a travesty. Because me, I love Splatoon for the unique weapons that it offers. When I first got into Splatoon 1 as a casual, I had absolutely no frame of reference about what was weak and what was strong. I played the game basically blindly, and I loved it. I wanted to find out what the best weapons were by simply playing the game and trying it out. The things that initially got me the most excited about the game were the different weapon classes. The idea of Roller. Interesting. Never seen anything like it. 
and as Splatoon 1 went by, it only introduced more and more weapons that I found interesting. I got to play Blasters. I got to play Sloshers. So many fun options like that. I really love the creativity that Splatoon brought to a genre that I really held not a lot of interest for before I got into it. Splatoon 1 changed the way that I looked at shooters in such a unique way, with not only its painting mechanic, but with all the creative weapon designs. I had that same feeling in Splatoon 2 for a very long time, and I was excited for new weapon classes such as Dooley's, Umbrella obviously, Tenebrella, my favorites, Washer, Ballpoint, other weapons too. Squelchy is awesome. I love it. I think it's great. But those kinds of feelings that I once had about the game, and how I felt like everything was so unique with weapon variety, feels like it's kind of lost presence in the game, honestly. The more that I've played this game, the better I've gotten at it. I've gotten pretty dang good at it, honestly. I've won that one Nintendo tourney back in July. So to improve so much at a game that I like, only for top level to be absolutely inundated with a bunch of shooters. Running around in a game where not many things feel super self-sufficient anymore. You can build comps with a weapon that's kind of unusual, but a lot of the time you're going to have to supplement it with shooters in order to offset the kind of risk reward you're seeing. You know, you'll still see comps. You'll see maybe Rapid Bucket to two shooters, like Neil's Bosch. Okay, cool. But it becomes more and more difficult because, you know, even if I say a Rapid Neo Splash Bucket sounds like a cool core. It is. But there's so much gatekeeping in this game in terms of weapon matchups. 52 is simply denying so many comps that I think would be really interesting otherwise. It feels like the kind of weapon where the risk reward is so skewed because if you pick a weapon like 52 and the opponent has no bombs, it basically feels like you win for free. And I'm telling you that because I play Brawl and Tana Brawl. When I played those weapons against teams or comps in solo queue even, where I saw no bombs or one bomb, I basically said, I may as well win, this matchup is free, like, what, what are they going to do about it, honestly? So to have shooters dominate the game when it feels like a weapon that's free from any real meaningful weaknesses, in the way that many weapons in Splatoon 2 are clearly balanced around their weaknesses, there's that feeling of frustration because there's a real monotony in team comps. It feels like not everyone's allowed to play their favorite weapon. It feels like a team that wants to win but do something different can only really run one or two different weapons, but they have to conform to some standard in order to keep up with the pace, the literal pace of shooters and their paint output, and their movement, and their kits, and their bomb output, and their special spam. And a lot of weapons simply can't keep up. And if they do, it's just the opponent maybe misplaying, not playing as patient as they could. It feels like if you pick shooters in this game, you have all the tools you need to win. But it feels like if you pick something that isn't a shooter, you need more tools to help enable you to win. And you can build team comps with that in mind, but what's stopping every team comp from just being composed of two to three, if not even four shooters? In a competitive environment, players will most likely flock to the options with the best risk reward ratio, because those options are the most consistent at winning, that don't need to worry about a lot of the things that a lot of other weapon classes need to. They don't have the headache of thinking, I'm playing Brawler or Tenta Brawler, I could die to a random suction bomb on top of my shield because the slightest bit of netcode. You don't have to worry about it. A lot of the more niche, difficult to play weapons, such as Brawler or Roller, they have a lot of concerns when they're playing this game. They're struggling to do even the most basic of things. I really miss the feeling of playing the game and going into a scrim and wondering like, what team combat am I going to fight today? Is it going to be Ballpoint Tetra? Is it going to be 10 Carbon? Is it going to be Explosher Try? Neo Splash Try? I thought that was interesting. It was some of the most fun I've ever had in the game, seeing weird team comps like that because I had to stop and think. I'm thinking, okay, interesting. How do I approach that? How do we win with the tools that we have? A lot of scrims feel like they just blend together nowadays. Even when I spectate the game, it feels like all I'm seeing is a bunch of armor dittos, missile spam dittos, K-52 mirrors, bomb spam with LD, weapons that aren't shooters merely getting overwhelmed by all the options that shooters have. Now, don't get me wrong. I know a lot of this video probably sounded like whining or complaining or me lamenting the fact my favorite weapon is not top one in the game. I get it. But I wanted to make this video to kind of express why I think I've been struggling to have fun with the game as much as I used to. 
So the cube can feel really uninteresting to me because the games don't really feel competitive at all. I don't really have a drive to go for XP either. Competitive has kind of felt stale for me lately, honestly, because everything I rambled about. That's how I feel, honestly, and I like having that sense of transparency with the people that like my content and, you know, I feel bad. I feel bad in a way. I feel guilty. It's not my job to stream Splatoon 2 or talk about it all the time. There are plenty of other interests I have, but it sucks to have an interest you like. And it feels like you just can't get invested the same way you used to. You know, it's even been to the point where I've been talking with my friends and I'm thinking, you know, maybe I'll stream Splatoon 1 again casually. You know, setting up the Wii U is kind of a pain, but honestly, I feel like the endgame meta of Splatoon 1 at this point has a bit more variety than the endgame meta of Splatoon 2 that I've been seeing lately. You know, I can play Zinc Mini in that game, I can play Normal Slosher. I didn't even mention it in the video, but my favorite weapons in Splatoon 1 weren't shooters. I basically never touched shooters in Splatoon 1, I was so happy. I played Normal Bucket, Dynamo, Carbon, and custom Rage Blaster. They are some of the most fun weapons that I've ever played in a game. I'll have my Twitch channel link in the description if you're curious about that or want to see me play other games, you know, outside of Splatoon. Big Toho fan, that's, you know, if you look at my Twitter for about two minutes, it's very easy to tell that. That's my other big interest, honestly, my biggest interest. But I hope you guys enjoyed watching the video. Maybe you learned a thing or two. Maybe it shifted your perspective on some things. Maybe it encouraged you to try something more niche. Maybe you want to play the weapon that I talked about that got nerfed a ton because they made it sound fun. That'd be awesome. I want to see more different weapons in this game. And let me know in the comments, what do you think your current thoughts on the metagame are? Do you play non-shooters and struggle to have fun the same way that I do? Or are you a shooter one trick that simply loves everything about life because all you see is shooters? All I can hope for right now is that Splatoon 3 brings the spotlight back to new weapon classes that aren't simply just shooters, and that it really highlights the unique aspect of Splatoon's weapons that got me interested in the series in the first place. Thank you for watching, it's been Keen. I hope you guys have a good day, good night, wherever you are, whatever time it is, and hopefully see you next time. Also, friendly reminder to subscribe, I would really appreciate it if you did. Thank you. If you already are, then thank you again.